Okay, I, I think uh, that's all of the formal presentations that we had in mind, but who knows, maybe there are others lurking in the room that I <laughs> forgot who were part of our, our, our project here. So uh, we wanted to leave uh, uh, a reasonable amount of time for Q&A, and I think we have done so. We have a good 40 minutes. Um, there are a number of, of points that uh, I may wish to add during the course of our discussion. Um, and I think some of the things that we kind of uh, briefly alluded to but really didn't go into more detail uh, have to do with how we've actually thought about conducting this research. Uh, this was, I mean, one reason why it's the, the issue is not very salient is that it is not easy to, in fact, obtain uh, many of the findings that we shared with you. Uh, we required considerable uh, skills with respect to languages, uh, acquisition of court documents, which were not uh, inexpensive, uh, probing of archives in uh, a variety of, uh, of, of places, uh, and then trying to pull all this together. So um, what you are seeing is the, the product of uh, uh, quite a, a lot of, uh, of energy, but hopefully you also have some kind of flavor for the uh, interesting work that we've done. So I have some more points to make here, but let me first see if there's some questions that people would like to uh, to make. Okay, Michael, why don't you start us off? Um, two things. First, I know from personal experience how hard it is to get primary documents in Russian. Okay. Did you, I'm not sure it would be useful at all, but you, did you look at the series the Russians put out, uh, Tommy Project SSSR, all the primary documents from their nuclear program? No, I did not, but perhaps we can. Yeah, it's, Kassa, I don't know if Jeffrey went to at any of those. Are they in Russian? Yes, it's yeah. 14 volumes. Yeah, this is, I think this is what, you know, this may be the, That may be the same thing. Yeah, we, we, okay. we have reached out to lots of different people, and uh, obviously, uh, you know, a key uh, interlocutor is David Holloway, who wrote the, uh, you know, the, the definitive study of uh, Stalin and the bomb. Uh, and David only recently uh, received an inquiry from us and referred us to this series, which is online. His initial perusal uh, of these online materials did not find anything, did not generate anything that he felt was relevant, but he didn't look at it in depth. And so this is something that is on our to-do uh, list here, Michael. But in your spare time, I mean, I see you here, you know, night and day uh, on the weekends. Uh, you're welcome to help. We're, we're looking for for more assistance. It's interesting too. Uh, what we didn't relate, and this is actually already told, I, th I think, in part, in the article that Jeffrey and I wrote in, in February of 2014, were the you know, was the progress that uh, the Soviet Union made in actually deploying. Uh, uh, and test, well, deploying uh, radiological uh, warheads. Uh, they're very, they're fascinating tales. I mean, Jeffrey uh, can regale you with some of these, uh, having to do with the use of uh, of rad waste and the uh, the medicinal qualities and prophylactic qualities of, of vodka uh, to guard against uh, uh, you know these the hazards of this uh, this material. I don't know if you want to say anything about that. The, the Soviet program, Jeffrey, now, or not? Well, I mean, I thought Sarah did a great job. I mean, the, um, I, mean I, I don't want me to tell the joke. I, mean, I would like to <laughs> Tell the joke. <laughs> yeah, we were going through um, uh, Rockets and People, uh, which, Michael, I, I know you know. Um, and that's actually where the two different warheads uh, were undergoing testing and, and sort of subsequent to our research, we realized that they were testing both gravity bombs and, and missile warheads. So we didn't know that. Uh, we only initially knew about the warheads. Uh, and, and, you know, Rockets and People actually presents this from the perspective of people working on the missile program who were really interested in nuclear warheads. And so it, well, it tells us the story of, you know, this is how we found out about this movie, that they're showing this terrible movie. And that the movie is the justification for their work, um, and and it it's a nightmare, right? And and it, it you know I mean the testing is awful, and so there's a particular incident where um, the the um, the warhead springs a leak, 
and this brown liquid begins trickling down the side. And uh, we sort of now know that they started using real radioactive materials for testing and then later switched to stimulants because they poisoned so many people. But because of this experience, everybody goes like scattering, right? Because they, they know that they're gonna be poisoned. But I guess the director knew it was a stimulant. So he walks up and he like wipes his finger through it and touches it to his tongue. He says, okay guys, it tastes like crap, but it's harmless. And I'm sure he didn't say crap. <laughs> uh, um, and, and then, you know, they all go back and, and, and he, he allows himself an extra shot of vodka. Um, to allay his terror and, and that it affects that pain. But I do think it really goes, at least from my perspective, I mean, what that always, what that goes to is how skeptical the people working on the program were, you know. They're making fun of this movie um, as being a pretty terrible reason to be risking their lives, um, and then they're quite frightened. Uh, about the Thanks, Jeffrey. Shay? Yeah. Um, so one thing that I kind of noticed was that though there were all these different programs, uh, they all kind of settled on different uh, radioactive materials to use in, uh, in, in the weapons. The U.S. settled on tantalum. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Egyptians were looking at uh, cobalt, um, and basically, uh, you know, uh, why, why do you think that is? Was it a matter of availability of materials? Was it that these, they saw these weapons as potentially having different uses, whereas the U.S. just wanted a short-term area denial system? Did some countries want, like, actually, we want to salt the earth and make sure no one can live there for a thousand years? Um, you know, why do you, why do you guys think that is? I, I, I think it's that latter uh, point you make. I think that <clears throat> I think that the, the, the concept of using something like cobalt sixty or cesium one thirty seven uh, in the United States was was unpalatable. You know, to 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 actually realize these dreams of you know of, of, of rendering huge swaths of the Earth's surface uninhabitable actually didn't <laughs> people didn't like that very much. Um, so, so yeah, they settled on this relatively short, uh, short life, um, half life uh, 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 isotope. Um, but in the Egyptian case, that was somewhat different. And again, it's I will say with the Egyptian case, it's hard to know where the Egyptian intentions begin, mm -hmm. and where sort of the, the 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 German scientist salesmanship ends. Like I, I, I don't want to impugn. Mm -hmm. Egypt or NASA or anyone else with um, with the implication that they were developing genocidal weapons, right? Um, there, you know, the, it's it's unclear how much uh, how much uh, how, what what the leash was on these uh, scientists, and frankly, whether or not they were telling the truth in their yeah. uh, court depositions. Anyway, I think there there, there is also I mean, kind of there there a few observations that may not appear to be internally consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, on the one hand, uh, what we have tend to find is that the more you probe, you pick any country that was interested in nuclear weapons, and you tend to find some interest at some point in time in radiological weapons. I mean, I would not be surprised if we were to uh, direct our energies to probing in India and Pakistan uh, uh, Yugoslavia. We're trying as best we can, Argentina and Brazil, but so far those have proved to be kind of dry holes. You, you find information that's not inconsistent with at least uh, exploration of the potential in this domain. So on the one hand, it's not just the case uh, or the set of countries that we've shared with you. The Israelis believe that the Iranians uh, you know, have such a program. Who knows what the, the Israelis may have <laughs> explored uh, uh, in this domain. Um, on the other hand, I think something that is important to convey here, I'm not sure that we uh, did so explicitly, is that it turns out to be more difficult uh, to manufacture a militarily useful radiological weapon than you might think. You can characterize this as a poor man's nuclear weapon, but if you ask about what are the capabilities, uh, it's not that simple uh, to do, which is so there are cost factors. Of, and I think Sam has, has uh, you know, demonstrated this most clearly in his research, where we have more access to information and the, uh, uh, the communications among various government agencies and scientists uh, you know, on the point. 
But there is another issue, and this relates to something that, uh, that Jeffrey uh, you know, raised here. And I think maybe it's best discussed under the, the kind of the theoretical literature of you know, why do countries pursue nuclear weapons? Why do countries forego nuclear weapons? If, in fact, uh, the driver of a nuclear weapons program is prestige, which we know it to be the case for some countries, then the dirty bomb probably doesn't uh, factor in very in a very attractive uh, uh, manner. Uh, I mean, if if uh, a country wanted to demonstrate its technical prowess, complicated as a dirty bomb might be, that would probably not be the weapon of choice. Uh, on the other hand, if one faced a uh, an adversary that might have overwhelming capabilities in other areas, including in the nuclear weapons sector. Uh, it's not out of the question uh, that one could you know, complicate the adversary's life considerably if one even had a rudimentary nuclear device. And that's why, although we haven't really focused on it very much since we got started, I would not rule out the prospects for the DPRK just because of say, the proximity of Seoul, the uh, the tunnels connecting uh, the north and the south, the kind of havoc that one could uh, cause, uh, and the difficulty of knowing, you know, what, what exactly is the threshold that you have passed if you were to use radiological weapons. So I think when we asked about, and we, we as you can tell, I mean, this was a very useful exercise for us because we meet almost every other week. We talk about the research that we're undertaking but we haven't yet really done the comparative analysis mm -hmm. and have teased out some of the, the important questions. So uh, in pre preparing for this talk, we began to do that more uh, uh, systematically, and I think <clears throat> we'll take away some issues here. But I, I think the question of you know, uh, you know, why do countries pursue these weapons uh, may depend upon uh, uh, considerations of international security, domestic politics, the, the Iraqi case, you, know, you want to see it at the table, uh, prestige, idiosyncratic factors, uh, the answers may be different depending upon the, uh, the source of the, uh, of the program. And by the same token, why you, why you stop. Uh, Fabian? Mm -hmm. May I add something to the choice of materials in the Iraqi case? Yes. Um, the Iraqis has lot, had huge amounts of zirconium for the conventional bomb um, manufacturing or incendiary bombs and cluster munitions, some of which apparently came indirectly uh, from the US, which is a fascinating story in itself through a, like, a Chilean arms dealer who built like, cluster bombs for Pinochet. And so there was one factor which was availability. The other thing which we, one must not forget is that like, at this point, Iranian troops were inside Iraqi territory. So if you would attack them, you wouldn't want to like, poison your own territory for years to come. But that also made the weapon really cumbersome because the half-life was so short that the weapon the material would have, been, uh, have to be irradiated and then put into the bomb and then dropped within one week. Afterwards, you couldn't use it anymore. So that's of course, like decreases the military utility quite a lot. Mm -hmm. So presumably if the Iraqis had had maybe a different material or something, or like a large quantity of that, yeah. they might have settled for that instead? Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions <coughs> or, uh, or comments here? Jeffrey, do you have anything you'd like to kind of add to our... No, I'm just quite happy. Actually, it was very cool um, because I hadn't, for example, picked up uh, the role of the U.S. Chemical Corps and, and, until now. So it was really great to hear other people's presentations. Something, uh, maybe I will follow up on the, on the, the uh, Joint Draft Treaty. Um, you know, I've pitched the idea uh, in the past to the P5 when it was meeting on a more regular basis, when they seemed preoccupied mainly in developing their lexicon. Uh, disarmament, that <clears throat> perhaps a more substantive uh, focal point for discussion would be dusting off this draft treaty. Uh, would it be possible perhaps today for the NPT acknowledged nuclear weapon states to try to revive uh, a prohibition treaty? <clears throat> and there was actually some interest in this on the part of a number of countries, including the Chinese, although it, it proved, as best I can, I mean, I'm not aware of the internal deliberations. <laughs> Um, today, at a time when the nuclear weapon states are hard-pressed 
to come up with anything of a concrete nature uh, to demonstrate their commitment, continuing commitment to Article 6, in particular in light of the, uh, their defensive mode because of the Prohibition Treaty. Again, maybe this is a kind of a disarmament uh, measure that uh, you know, might resonate. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have a, uh, an international treaty. It's something that they could do, you know, uh, those countries that sought to, uh, to take the steps to uh, uh, prohibit the weapons could do so. Coalition of the willing, if you uh, will. Um, so I, I think there still may be uh, some life left in that uh, initiative, but uh, we'll have to wait and, and see. And if, if I could add one thing, um, <laughs> one thing that was missing in the uh, del deliberations and discussion of the uh, draft for Ideological Weapons Convention was any mention of the fact <coughs> that the United States or the Soviet Union or the United Kingdom or any of these countries actually had radiological weapons programs. So when they were talking about it, and it's, by the way, not clear that the diplomats themselves were aware of that uh, fact. So as when they were trying to make a case, other countries were like, what, 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 is, what is this? Why would, why, would we, uh, why, would we, why would we spend whatever limited uh, time and capital we have to, um, you know, for a convention for a weapon that doesn't exist and never has, you know, so. Those are the uh, easiest ones to apply. Yeah, I suppose, I suppose, I suppose so. But, yeah. Okay, well, stay tuned. Uh, we have uh, a lot more work to do. We have uh, a really troves of documents that we are still uh, translating. We have individuals uh, around the world uh, helping us in our research. Uh, but I hope you now have a little bit better sense of what this project is all about. So please join me in thanking our presenters.